The Beer EDU Podcast, Episode 104, Culturally Responsive Teaching with Zach Logan. Welcome to the Beer EDU Podcast, the podcast for educators that love to learn and share ideas with fellow educators over beers, with your hosts, Kyle Anderson and Ben Dixon. Kyle, my man, what's up? Oh, same old, same old, but not really, because here we are, we're recording another episode of the Beer EDU Podcast. Yes, episode 104, and I am... Ben Dixon, you can find me on Twitter and Instagram at bdixonnv, and you, my friend? I am Kyle Anderson. You can find me on Twitter and Instagram at Anderson EdTech, AndersonEdTech.net for your blog reading pleasure. And then my book, To the Edge, Successes and Failures Through Risk-Taking, available on Amazon, BarnesandNoble.com, and through my publisher, Edumatch Publishing. And because we drink beer on the Beer EDU podcast, that's what we're going to do right now. So, Ben, what do you have Okay, so I, shocker, have an IPA. So, no. um, <laughs> so I'm going with out of Turlock, California. This is a Dust Bowl Brewing, their Hops of Wrath IPA. So this is 6.6% ABV, 50 IBU, lots of citrus, lots of floral. I mean, just a solid IPA. I feel like I say that a lot. It's like, I mean, it's, yeah, it's, and if you're like, watching us on the live stream it is a tall can so you can interpret how my day went if i'm pounding a tall can but let's just it's a tall can <laughs> you I my friend <laughs> need to go back and see if i've had that but i can almost guarantee i have only because a i right. love dust bowl brewing beer to right. begin with and we and were talking before we hit live that the food at their restaurant right. in turlock is incredible but the the whole premise behind dust bowl is based off of the Great Depression and those that moved to California for the jobs because of the Dust Bowl. And then there's a lot of the beers are themed off that. And that one is themed off of my favorite book of all time, The Grapes of Wrath. And just so I guarantee I've had that beer. I would just have to go back and double check. Yes. Classic, classic uh, um, IPA, classic Steinbeck um, book. I mean, fun fact my wife's grandmother used to clean Steinbeck's house. Nice. So in in, in Monterey. So there nice. you go. Oh, there's a, that's a nice connection. Then so I will counter that connection. A kind of cool one. My wife is related to Samuel Clemens, also known as Mark Twain. Oh, there we go. Yeah, so that's in the matter root ceremony. Buddy. Yeah. So she's got some uh, <laughs> connection to him somehow. So that oh. those are both really cool connections, though, to some classic American literature. So. So I have to take I have to take back all my trash talking about people from Vegas not being real in Nevadans. Then I guess. Yeah, there we go. <laughs> <laughs> all right, man. So so enough about that. So what do you have, my friend? So I went with Tioga Sequoia Brewing, which is just about an hour south right. of Turlock um, out of Fresno. And I've got their Rush Hour Breakfast Stout. So oh. this one is oh. 8% ABV and it is 35 on the IBU. So it's got the coffee. It's got the chocolate. It's sweet because they add the lactose to it. Super smooth. And I mean... You and I, you, you talk about how much you love your IPAs, but you also love your stouts. So we're, we're fans of the stouts on the show. I, and yes. this is definitely a great breakfast stout. I actually bought this one from the brewery. Just okay. at, I saw the name of the beer and what it was and just bought it. I didn't even try it there. I'm like, I know this is going to be good. And it does not disappoint. I, and I'm like, I'm thinking I have never, I don't think I've ever had this one. I don't think I've ever, I'd have to go back in my, in my untap. I don't think I've ever had a Tioga the Sequoia Brewing, I, I don't think I've had one. I honestly don't know if I've ever seen them outside of the Central <laughs> Valley. I'm not sure what their right. distribution's like, but uh, we have the edgy homies in Adam Juarez yep. and Joe Marquez, Eddie Campos in the Central Valley. And now that things are starting to loosen up a little Open bit up, on restrictions, yeah. <laughs> you might be able to see people a little more often. And I've already told them, if you're going to be passing through Las Vegas, you need to bring some Tioga back for me. And I, he yeah, may or may not have been here at this point, depending on when this drops, but right. Adam is going to be coming through Las Very Vegas. Nice. I'm supposed to hook up with him and Kat and his children, and uh, he will be bringing me some Tiago nice. Sequoia on the way down nice. here. So I'm excited about that. Awesome. So, hey, if 
this is a beer to you. We've we've got our beer. We also have a guest. That so, yeah, that we do. And I'm really excited for this yes. guest because this is somebody that when you and I first started this podcast, it was right when I started working at Carson High School. And right. I met this gentleman working there, and he also has a podcast. So we kind of geeked out a little yes. bit about that. And and he's like, I would love to come on your show sometime. And it just never happened. And now Finally, three years later, we're making it happen. So ne it's never too late. So it's all good. But um, yes, let's take a moment. Let's welcome Zach Logan to the show. So yes. Zach, how's it going? It is going all right. And I have to say that is like mostly my fault. You gave <laughs> me like the, the form to fill out. And I was just sitting on it for like three years. And then finally, I was like, oh, crap, I need to fill this thing out so that is, that is my bad <laughs> no, it's all good and but the best part about that is that you still had the email with the four minute you didn't even have to get a hold of me and say oh, hey can you God. send me that form again you sat on that thing you literally did for three yep. years that's great yeah no it was one of those i was just thinking and i'm like oh my gosh I've been listening to the podcast and I've totally spaced <laughs> on ever filling out this form and so I knew exactly where I needed to go to find it Oh, perfect. So no worries. All right. Well, now we were talking a little bit beforehand that you did not bring a beer to the show, but you're a beer drinker. You enjoy. So what, what is your go-to beer that you normally would go to? Yeah. So right now I'm kind of doing a, a bit of a cleanse. So I'm going the light beer route. Um, you know, my family's from Milwaukee, Wisconsin. So I got to give a shout out to Miller Lite. If I am drinking beer in this new diet of mine, it's going to be a Miller Lite. But I do love Revision IPA. That's one Ooh. that I, I haven't had in a while and I miss it. Yeah, you never can go wrong right. with Revision IPA or really anything from Revision. They no. they do a lot of great work uh, with everything that they do there. So, but um, I and I now know the connection why you're a Green Bay Packer fan. I guess I never realized you were from the Milwaukee area because I and I knew you were a Packer fan. But I'm like, but Packer fans are everywhere. So <laughs> yeah. it wasn't really that yeah. much of a stretch because I mean I know Packer fans mm -hmm. in California in the South. They're all over the place. Yeah, yeah, they're they're quite all over the place. Um, I'm not from Wisconsin, but my dad's family, they're all from okay. Milwaukee. So it, I didn't really have a choice. Yeah, yeah, there you go. You got street cred, though. So you got yeah. street cred for football and for beer. So I will say, you know, that that's yeah. cool. But you're you're currently you are like south of where I am, north of Kyle, you're in Carson and yeah, tell us a little bit like, what do you do? What's, what's your passion? We know what you like. We know you like beer. We know like Packers, but what else? Yeah. So I actually teach at Pioneer High School in the Carson City School District, which is a title one at risk school. And I've been there for four years now. Um, and I teach social studies. So I teach economics, I teach U.S. history, I teach government, um, and I also teach a dual credit college course there, career and professional development. And then um, I don't know how I find time for it, but I also teach a college course at Sierra Nevada University, um, culturally responsive pedagogy. Whoa. <laughs> yeah. So you have a little bit, and you do a podcast, which we're going to get into yeah. later, because that's because I'm I'm super excited about that. But I want to talk about this other stuff too. So, uh -huh. so tell us. I know, I know you're so you're teaching at at the high school, and then I, I'm super interested in the class you're teaching at Sierra Nevada because it's extremely relevant right now. Yeah. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so tell us about that. Yeah. So I I just graduated last spring in the middle of this, or at the beginning of the pandemic, I should say, um, and. I my whole project was based around culturally responsive pedagogy. And so finally, Sierra Nevada University created this course and asked me to teach it. Um, and so I have the the task of teaching that over Zoom for uh, the remainder of this school year. So that's kind of the challenge is trying to teach something that deals with that content in a Zoom environment. Um, but that's something that I'm extremely passionate about because it's, it's so relevant in all education uh, areas, no matter where you are, whether you're urban or rural, but um, especially at the school I teach at, um, just encountering those different cultures. And whenever I had that aha moment um, working, especially with Title I at-risk students, where I was able to be more culturally responsive or culturally relevant, 
um, I saw just amazing stuff in my classroom. Yeah, so just a touch before we get into it a little bit further, you, you mentioned that Pioneer High School is an alternative high school. Now, that could mean a lot of different depending on where you're at. So I know where I'm at, that essentially means behavior school where students have gotten removed for different behavioral issues. Um, but Pioneer is not a behavior school. So could you tell us a little bit more about what, what exactly is the difference between your school and, say, the main high school that's in Carson City? Yeah, and, and there are there, there's quite a bit of confusion even in 2021 regarding Pioneer High School in the Carson City School District because it was started as kind of that behavioral school. So depending on who you talk to in the district, they might say that. They might say that we are a behavior school. Um, and so that creates its own um, issues, how we relate to the, um, the different content areas with as far as like district-wide PLCs. Um, we are no longer just that, although we do get students sent there every now and then because they just can't make it in other schools. But uh, basically at Pioneer, we just are an alternative route. And so we do a lot of things like credit recovery. Um, I think students can earn up to eight credits or something a, 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 right. a year um, or more. And, you know, so we, we have that environment. And of course, we have a much smaller campus so we get a lot of students that maybe suffer from like social anxiety and they can't really make it in a large classroom they really find their place at pioneer because we're capped at 20 kids um and it's very rare that we get there like some of my larger courses like u.s history all every now and then get up to 20 but some of my other courses i have you know as little as 10 or less. And so it's something where those kids that suffer from, you know, social anxieties or just all the different anxieties that come along with being in a school um, and the different uh, learning hurdles that some of these students have to encounter, they really do thrive at Pioneer. And so I think that's the biggest distinguishing factor um, that allows us to be Pioneer High School. Well, and I have to imagine that you have some great relationships with your kids because you have that smaller class size, which I think when you describe kids that maybe have some anxiety about being at a, at a, comp, at a huge high school, and Carson, Carson High School, at least up here in the north, is one of the biggest. It is a huge high school. So I got to imagine that, that that does allow you to, to have more connection with your kids. Yeah, absolutely. And quite frankly, it won't work like teachers won't have success in the classroom unless they do build those relationships with students. And we've seen a number of teachers really struggle with that and not find their place at Pioneer because it does take a lot of work because um, even though we're not a behavioral school, we still deal with a lot of those behavioral issues and if you don't right off the like right off the bat get have a relationship with these students, you might lose them. And you once they're gone, they are gone. Like you won't see them until the end of the year. Um, and and the pandemic has added a whole nother level of that. Yeah, which kind of brings me to my next question is, I mean, the pandemic obviously has been tough on all schools across the country and really around the world because this is a worldwide pandemic. So. But the struggles that you would have as a teacher and as a student in a place like Pioneer probably were exasperated even more as a result. So, like, what did you see different from your students and those that you work with as a result of the pandemic? Well, it's definitely not a secret that Pioneer High School struggles with the absentee rate. And so we've always had quite a large um, absenteeism uh, rate. And that was heightened, you know, probably an extra 50% due to the pandemic. And so that was kind of the biggest thing, especially the first semester when we were doing kind of the hybrid schedule, where they would do uh, asynchronous stuff uh, at home, they were expected to do asynchronous work at home and then uh, work synchronously with their peers you know, twice a week. And so that was just a nightmare. And I think it was a nightmare across the board in all education spheres in the country. Um, but it was really a nightmare for us because we had a number of students that already had the kind of um, issues of getting to school in the first place, 
they came to us with a with a large absentee struggle and then of course the pandemic hits and now they're expected to come twice a week and then when they get come in the twice uh, two times a week they get lectured for not doing this stuff at home so they basically figured well if i'm not going to do the stuff at home there's no point in me going to school on you know tuesday thursday so i'm just not going to do it um so we we saw a huge struggle then we we saw it pick back up when we because at pioneer we are such a small campus that we could fit uh all of our students with that six feet of social distancing and we have enough rooms to where if we did have to have overflow we could put them in an overflow room um and then they would zoom in to the classroom but they would be in an overflow room with their other with other classmates as well so it was it definitely presented a number of struggles um we've seen it get better and you know i think that we're not exempt from all the other struggles that um that schools are facing i just think that a lot of schools that had a high absentee rate before saw that heightened even more well and i and i wonder because your school does currently it, you've always it, it sounds like dealt with some some issues with absenteeism it, it, but i mean you have some some ways to access kids did you find like okay we know how to we know how to get kids re-engaged do you feel like it was easier for you guys to get the kids back um it definitely needed everyone at the school involved we needed our um our office staff is outstanding and so they really did a lot of like the boots on the ground work where they were doing the majority of the phone calls um but it really took all the teachers calling students as well and saying hey we're back full time now like you can come in and have a normal classroom experience you know social distancing which was the new normal but you could have kind of some remnants of normality so Mm -hmm. once we were able to get a hold of all of the students because once again we're dealing with um at risk students so we had kids that were you know moving around they didn't have a stable home they didn't have a permanent home so their number at the beginning of the year may have been completely different than by the time they started Mm -hmm. and they didn't change it in the system so that caused another hurdle where we had to find those students figure out where they were Um, because they were no longer and you know this is kind of sad but they were no longer at the motel that was down the street they're at some other place and um but once we were able to get a hold of them we saw it pick back up um we've had some more struggles since then just with i think everyone is just over it uh (laughs) as far as how this pandemic is going um and that kind of caused another wave of students like you know, whatever. Um, and so right. that's been our current struggle that we are now at the end of the year is approaching. We are seeing some success with getting them back again. I, I think you touch on something too. And I, I'd be interested, Kyle, what your thoughts are on this, because I think we all have been doing this for a while. We know that once, once you get towards the end of the year, kids are kind of like, peace out. I'm good. You know, it's like three weeks left of school, four weeks of school. And I feel like you're right. It's exact. It, it. I feel like it's tenfold now because everyone's done with the with the mask with social. I mean, kids are tired. Parents are tired. Adults are tired. So I'm. I, I. I do see even at the elementary level. I notice my kids are, while they physically won't check out because their parents don't bring them to school. Mentally, I wonder sometimes that they're like, we're done. And I don't know, Kyle. You guys are back, but I wonder if you're seeing the same thing. Well. With the high schools in the district where I'm at, the hybrid situation that we're in, very, very few kids are actually back. So out of a class roster of, I have one class that's 40 students. I have at most maybe four kids on a day when they're supposed to come in. So, And the way our schedule works out with the different cohorts, I end up only seeing those kids once every two weeks. So Hmm. over the course of the time since we've been back, I've only seen specific students a grand total of four, maybe five times is all. And that's if they've come to every session that they were scheduled for. So and then as we're recording this, we're winding the school year down. Our last day for students is on May 26th. So we're actually in the process of starting a finals here as we're recording this. 
and all the finals are 100% virtual. So I'm not going to see students for the remainder of the school year now at this point. And uh, I mean, so we had to move everything up in regards to, oh, this is the last day that we're doing any sort of work. This is the last day that Mm -hmm. you'll be able to turn stuff in because of the deadlines for getting their grades in. So, and that's a topic for another day about the rights and the wrongs behind grading systems and, and all that jazz. So it's just strange with that. But as time has gone on, we're seeing fewer and fewer kids log in online. Those that are scheduled to come in person, some of them I never saw at all. Like they were supposed to, but then they never just showed up. So right. a handful of me had ended up seeing online. They're just like, no, I just decided to stay at home. Others, they just never showed up. Mm-hmm. And so it's been just really strange with that. Well, then, like I'm sure it is in your districts, we're having summer remediation slash summer school, whatever you want to right. call it. And a lot of kids are going to be going, not just for the academic stuff, but some kids are going to go because, you know what, yes. I just need to be there in person around other people. So there's a lot of kids doing that. And I, I had this conversation with my principal one day where – you're going to have kids that are already just fried from this year and how ridiculous it's been. And they're going to go to summer school. Some of whom are going to go all the way through the end of July because they're behind on credits. And we start school back up on August 9th. So some of these kids are going to have like maybe a week off by the time it's all said and done. And I've got kids on my case. I've had conversations with their parents. I said, listen, I'm not going to tell you what to do, but I would say choose either the first session or the second session for summer school and give your kid a month off. The kid needs it. And then with my principals talking about with summer school, maybe going in and working with kids just to kind of help keep them on track and be a cheerleader for them because so many of kids are already discouraged and then they're going to be in summer school on the short schedule. And it's just, I don't want to see a bunch of kids that already failed courses and they're in summer school for credit retrieval only to turn and fail those because they just get discouraged. So it's a, it's a crazy situation and we could talk for hours about this, but uh, yeah. So Zach, are you guys doing, are you guys doing summer school slash learning loss recovery? I don't know. We're all calling it something else. Yeah. I think there are 20 different names for the same thing, but yes, we are doing right now. We're just calling it summer school. So um, down a pioneer, it's just, you know, uh, that but I, it's kind of the same thing the same issue like let's get these kids in here that you know that that didn't make it or that uh that struggled because i also in uh, the other role that i take on i also teach an online course for carson city school district where i have like 81 students and wow. i i would be shocked if 40 if 40 of those 80 passed that course wow. because so many of them have 0% done. And it's not that uh, we ha- couldn't contact them. It's just simply when we contact them, they're like, yeah, I know I got to get it done. All right. Well, I want you to get an assignment in today. Otherwise I'm calling again tomorrow. And so then right. it just kind of turned into this whole thing where parents are like, yeah, they just don't want to do it. They're over the school year. They're going to make it up um, next mm-hmm. year. And so now we're bringing those students into summer school which might cause its own issues because now they're going to be like, um, like you were saying, we have this issue where there's so little time, but so Mm -hmm. much time that we have to make up for. And that is a huge hurdle that I think is going to be, um, summer school may go smoothly. It's either going to go smoothly and the students are going to be jazzed to be back and they're going to get it done because they're going to be motivated or it's right. going to be, um, you know, kind of overflow of the same heartburn that we've been experiencing all right. year. But hopefully, and I and I think that where it'll be is the students that are going to struggle most with the heartburn might be there in summer school. So right. when they come back in August, they may already have taken the Tums or the Pepto-Bismol mm-hmm. and they may be good with the heartburn and be ready to roll. Um, so, you know, I, I'll stay optimistic from that point. Yeah, I, and I think it is interesting because your both your your perspectives are from a high school, whereas we're looking at elementary. And what I've been doing is reaching out to my parents that are so in in my district, we're 
we're all back, but I have families that have opted for distance learning. So I have about a hundred kids that are on distance learning. And really what I've hammered with my families is like, I need you to come back for summer school. Not because, not because I'm concerned about your academics. I mean, I am, but I'm concerned about just coming back to school, meeting kids, having like how, how, like what's a school day look like? Cause we're doing three days, three solid school days, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday. And I, I want kids to kind of ease in. Cause I know like that we see kids all the time that come back in our district from distance learning. And then we drop them right into a classroom. And I mean, they've been at home doing work, but in their pajamas. And then, you know, they do some work and go play Fortnite and then they come back and do some work. And whereas like, now we're like, Oh no, you're going to stay all day and you're going to do work. And then you go to lunch and then you come back and do some work. And they're like, I'm tired. So I worry about that. And I, I, and I, I want them just, and I, I, and I know in high school, it's so different because you have credit recovery because that's the whole issue. And I mean, as someone who may have experienced credit recovery as a younger, younger person, um, it is really important that you go to get those credits. But I just worry that kids are not used to being around other kids and like, we, they socialize, but not in the school setting. I think that's the big part. Yeah, and that's so huge, right? Because what does it look yeah. like to do schoolwork in a peer collaborative thing? I'm huge on, you know, peer-to-peer -peer interaction to digest uh, historical documents or digest an activity that I'm doing in government and economics. So it's just, right. it's one of those things where, what does that look like? These students have had an entire year ripped out from underneath them. And it's, it's a year that is going to have negative um, side effects, I believe, going into next year. Because like you were saying, what does it look like to have a normal class period? What does it look like to sit down next to someone my age from a different background and to work with them. I haven't been with anyone from a different background for the last year. I've been with people from the same exact background. What does it look like for me to work with that student? And I think that's going to be um, a lot of the heartburn. It might be a beautiful thing to experience. And so that's kind of where I, my mindset is, is like being able to experience those students uh, have that again for the first time. Um, but it could also, it could also be, come with extra heartburn i don't know well that is a, I, that's a great point that i i don't think i've really thought about is like these kids have chosen who they want to interact with because they've been at home i mean yeah we put them in zoom sessions and everything but you don't really have to interact it's another thing to sit next to a kid who comes from a different background than you that maybe has a different viewpoint of life and how do you work with that person because that's the real world well and then the beginning of every school year you have to take a week, two weeks to just establish routines and expectations for a class. But because so many kids mm -hmm. just that a year out, they've been gone for a year, it's going to take longer for that oh, yeah. for next year. And one of my co-teachers and I that I know I'm working with again next year, we're already trying to figure out what that's going to look like and how some of our routines, we're not going to necessarily establish them academically until and use them until the next quarter second quarter so that first nine weeks it's going to be a lot of non-academic uses of those things like we want to start using things like adobe spark and flipgrid in our class more often next year so but rather than saying on day one okay here's an equation solve it and then explain it over flipgrid we're not doing that we're going to do fun stuff with it to establish that routine it's just going to take that much longer going into next year because of that that year, just like you said, Zach, being ripped away. And you said I, something. I, yeah, go ahead. No, I, I, well, I just wonder, I wonder if we're going to see a benefit from that because I think sometimes we're, we're in such a rush and we assume kids got it and we can hit, we can hit content. Whereas maybe like us slowing down might help. I don't know. Zach, what are you, if you were going to share something. Well, just kind of one of my approaches to everything, um, and, and it kind of relates to this kind of culturally responsive pedagogy, is this idea of we have these amazing softwares that students can use now. 
and they can be fun. And I'm convinced I might just be, you know, the typical history teacher, but I think it could be fun to make something historically created, connected to the content in things like Flipgrid or in things like Jamboard or in things like using Kami or whatever other system we're using. Um, but the students are already turned off by it because our approach before the pandemic was solve the equation. You're going to be introduced to this awesome platform that you can use in the future, but you're going to be introduced to it and no offense, a boring way and, and a way that's not engaging to right. you right now. And so what if we approached it like, you know, and this is kind of typical education talk, the same way that these students interact with video games, like let's give them a tutorial with something that they are better suited to understand. And so this is like, you know, the the stereotypical make a, you know, virtual poster that represents you, whatever, whatever it is um, that, you know, I think that if we do take that time and we get to know the students while they're working on something like Flipgrid, because we're doing it in a more fun way because we don't have districts telling us hey pacing you got to get through this unit by this date and i think if we have that flexibility we might actually see more success in the classroom no i think i think you're right on i think that that's that's that it, it's going to be so interesting because we all have kids like like Whereas you are Zach, you're gonna have kids coming back. They've maybe been there since January. I mean, Kyle, you're gonna have kids that have just started three months ago. Whereas my kids have been there, not all of them though. And like our high schools and our our high schools and our middle schools, they're hybrid. So yeah, we're gonna have to that whole thing of and it, we've said it a million times, go slow to go fast. We're really gonna have to go slow. Just yeah. everybody calm down. <laughs> My, my principal has said on more than one occasion in staff meetings about how next year we're going to have two freshman classes because yeah. out of our freshman class, whatever our freshman class is, and I'm not lying when I say it's probably close to 800 because my school is massive. We have yeah. we have like 3,500 kids uh, that go to our school, but you're going to have most of those kids have never set foot on our campus, and then you're going to have incoming eighth graders setting foot on our campus. So freshman orientation next year is going to be mind boggling because not only are you going to have the students that are incoming freshmen, but you have sophomores that basically are incoming freshmen because they've never seen campus in a school setting. So it's going to be really interesting to see how that works. But now shifting a little bit, Zach, you said that you did your master's thesis on culturally responsive teaching. So I'd love to hear a little bit more about that thesis and then how that morphed into you teaching a class on it at the university where you got your degree. So that's just, that's a really cool, just intriguing thing just to hear it on the surface. So I want to hear more. Yeah. So my master's project, the whole basis was using the civil rights movement as a model for resilience training. And it's a instructional guide for uh, 11th grade who deal with students with childhood trauma. So that's the approach, even though um, the trauma itself shouldn't be approached as a culture because there's not a culture of trauma. There are side effects that um, express itself in similar ways, but I can get into all that on a, on a different time. But basically I took culturally responsive teaching methods by changing just little things that, uh, from the require the taking the required curriculum first that the state says in Nevada, you have to teach and then making adjustments to fit the students and providing that in a, um, in a practical way for teachers is kind of what I wanted to do. And it's something that I'm passionate about. And the whole reason I got into teaching in the first place, um, I was originally going to go the law route. And then I met a lawyer that I was going to intern for. And he basically was like, it sounds like your passion is that you think that the whole system has crumbled at the education level. So maybe you should pursue the education level. And I'm like, dude, I got accepted into your internship in Alabama. What are you talking about? I should do that. Um, and so anyway, I did that. And that's kind of been the driving factor. 
but it, it's just, you know, <sighs> absorbing your students as much as they're absorbing the content and, uh, adjusting the content based on that that's the best way i can describe it is just figuring out where your students are in life what their experiences are and um for us at pioneer high school a lot of the experience is trauma and so mm -hmm. adjusting it in a way and so i use resilience in my classroom um a part of every rubric that i have deals with resilience so it's like you were faced with a tough task how did you respond to it and and i provide feedback in their actual rubric where it's like you gave up um i would like to see you on the next one when you experience these issues not give up keep pressing forward and they're like why am i being graded on this mr logan and it, and it was basically like because i think at by the end of the year you will see growth and that growth will be encouraging and there is a uh, this is obvious but there's a connection to resilience and success. And taking that a step further, um, we use ACEs. And so it's just a survey. It's about 20 questions or so. And you're basically graded out of 10. And anything like a six or higher, you've experienced some probably some severe trauma. Well, Pioneer High School, we're about 83% uh, seven or higher. And so it's it's one of those things where most of our students have experienced that trauma mm -hmm. and that has shaped a lot of their approaches to everything, including education. And so taking so I kind of took those typical research based culture responsive teaching practices that honestly you can just Google and mm -hmm. applying it in different areas. And so that's I think was the interview for my uh, position at Sierra Nevada University, and they just asked me if I wanted to teach that at the university level for teachers um, or uh, teachers in training or teachers seeking recertification. And so, yeah, that's what I do once a week. I teach it over Zoom, which is extremely difficult, but <laughs> we're making it. <laughs> well, and and I and Zach, I would be curious. As you move, as you think about moving in an next year, it's something I've talked with my staff about and, and other people we've talked in our district because like the amount of trauma that children, that, that kids are going to bring to school because of the pandemic. I mean, are you guys, are you guys thinking about like, how are we going to, I mean, you clearly in your school have a, have a, have a grasp on that, that your kids are going to come with trauma. Do you feel like there's going to be added trauma on top of trauma? Yeah, I think so. And, you know, one of the biggest things is not only have students been ripped away from their social aspect at school, but they've also been ripped away from potentially the only consistent thing in their lives. And for some of them, school was their escape from the trauma. So now they've been in that trauma for a year straight with no escape. Um, and so I think that's where we'll have that trauma on top of trauma. Um, and then we may also have the trauma on top of trauma where maybe the one person in their life, grandma, wh who was their biggest supporter, got COVID and, you know, maybe died. Maybe they didn't see grandma for a year because they had to quarantine from grandma because grandma was susceptible to the virus. And so that adds a layer. And so, you know, we may have students coming in with a lot of, uh, things like that, you know, the side effects of that, that could be um, depression, could be uh, a lot of different things. And so it's just about addressing that. We have a pretty good um, protocol for that at Pioneer that teachers are made aware of as soon as they start teaching there uh, because we do deal with it. And it's like one of those things to where now we have, we have some family related issue occur at Pioneer High School multiple times a week um and so it's and i think it, that's true at every school but because we are such a small campus it's more known than a larger school environment i've thought about this quite a bit over the past year about how when i used to coach back in the day you'd have your game you'd get back to the school or if you it was a home game games wrapping up around 10 o'clock or whatever and you're there as a coach until almost midnight, waiting on a kid to get picked up, or maybe they're just hanging out and they're telling you, no, I'm just waiting on my ride, but they're just hanging out. 
And in the beginning, as a young teacher, I'm like, man, these kids, they just need to go home. Like, we all want to go home. Why aren't they just going home? But as time goes on, you, you start to realize why they're not going home, because they feel safer at school. And you, you've, you've mentioned a couple of different times about having different things ripped away. And that's another thing that that safe space for so many kids was ripped away from them. And I just really wonder how that's going to affect kids, those ones that were hanging out after school for several hours on campus and um, unfairly being judged sometimes by adults at the school. Like, what what is this kid up to? Like, wh why are they still here? What kind of trouble are they trying to cause when it was more of just like, I'm going to sit on this curb because I don't want to go home because I don't want to face what's going on at home. So, but I've thought about that a lot. And I mean, I don't know if your research had anything to do with those types of kids or, or if you have your own thoughts about what, how this pandemic is going to affect that. Yeah. I mean, I think it's, I think it's going to affect it negatively and provide the schools with an opportunity to turn that, that negative impact into something positive that we can do. It's just, are we going to be um, intentional with doing those things? And are we capable? I mean, do you have a thousand students at your school? It may not be attainable for you to find every kid who's hanging out on the curb. And you, you said something that is so true. There's this stigma that when they're hanging out on the curb, they're causing mischief, right? They're about to, you know, whatever the worst possible thing that we can think of they're going to do on that curb. And it may be as simple as they're waiting for everyone to clear out so that they can leave because they've been staging this whole thing. Like you were saying, I'm waiting for my ride, but they don't want the shame of being seen walking by themselves because they know their ride's not coming. And, um, and there could be multiple reasons why the ride's not coming. And for some of our kids, it's like mom texts me, she can't drive because she's intoxicated. So I have to walk home. Well, they don't want to tell us that when they've been waiting on the curb for 15 minutes already and they call mom and they say, hey, where are you? And this happens to me because part of my afternoon duties is I'm in the parking lot and I'm in the area where students are waiting for their rides to be picked up. And I witness this all the time where a, a kid picks up their phone and says, hey, where are you at? I'm at school's over. And then they kind of their voice gets lower. and They're like, oh, OK, yeah, yeah. And then we're just like, right coming? Yeah, you're, you're just going to be late. And then 10 minutes later, they start walking because they mm -hmm. realize I'm not going anywhere. Right. And right. so really that conversation was probably whatever reason we can't pick you up. Um, and they don't feel comfortable with telling us that reason. And, you know, that's that's the part that sucks about the job. And one, I think that if we're intentional enough, we might be able to tear down a lot of barriers with that kid. I think so, back to a kid that in a football game years ago, I, I, I want to say he he dislocated his shoulder or a collarbone. It, like, it, it was an injury, not, nothing major, nothing emergency. It's like, but we call, we call the parent because the parent wasn't there and said, hey, I'm here with your kid and the trainer is suggesting that they go to the doctor. Can you come and get them to take them to the doctor? And I'm not even kidding you. The parents said, and I could tell that they were loaded, whether they were drunk or if they were high or whatever. But the parents said, no, just call an ambulance and we'll, I'll, I'll deal with it later. And I'm like, I, it, it's not that serious. We don't need to call an ambulance. We're like, Well, that's the only way he's going to end up getting there. So this kid that's just in a sling for a dislocated shoulder, whatever it was, is getting loaded into an ambulance at that point. And I, I wonder how that affected that kid. I mean, this was like almost 15 years ago. And I still think about that sometimes. And what kind of effect that had on that kid in the moment and then beyond. And like, if that kid mm -hmm. still revisits that, Oh, when I was in high school, I got injured playing football and my parent may be going in an ambulance over something minor. So. Well, and, and this kind of goes back to my question for you, Zach, as you talked about ACE, the ACEs. I mean, does your staff use that with kids? I know it sounds like you're very familiar with it. Is your staff familiar with it? Yeah, so we we didn't distribute it this year because of the pandemic and all the other issues. We just couldn't tackle getting that survey distributed. But whenever we first gave it two years ago, the plan was that we would give it to incoming freshmen 
and that those okay. freshmen would take it um, as they come into Pioneer High School. And I don't know if that's the plan still, but that is something that um, we would take a full class period. We'd bring in a third party. So it wasn't someone from the school district. It was someone mm -hmm. who was, you know, ACES certified or whatever, and they would right. distribute it. They would get the information. We wouldn't get the information. And then they would just send us a report. So okay. we want, and so we wouldn't even be able to see, cause it's completely um, anonymous when no, there are right. no names attached to it, but you can see like individual, you know, student 616, right. you know, uh, these, this is their aces. We don't see that. We just see the percentage overall. And so okay. it gives us a good idea, um, which is still useful because for me, it's like, oh, okay. The freshmen are now coming into my classroom 75% have an eight or higher. So I'm just going to assume that every single one of my classrooms is going to be 75% eight or higher. Mm -hmm. And I mm -hmm. think that taking in that assumption is because it doesn't have a negative effect on students that don't have aces. Like it's not like I'm right. over there, you know, baby, th babying them and, you know, you know, right. having these life talks with them. And so it doesn't affect the students that ha may have zero aces. They may, right. um, so it's, but yes, we are aware of it. Um, and we are pretty trained on how to, uh, distribute it and, and respond to the data and what the data means. And so that's one of the cool things that once again, with our small campus, we have been able to do, which has informed my teaching quite a bit. Well, it, I, I think it's really good that you, I, I know that's a discussion really, I've, I've seen it at a national level is like with the ACEs, when you look at like children who are, are affected by trauma, do you identify those kids? Cause then, then we get into a whole issue of like, we're identifying kids that have trauma. Then what does this mean? Like, like down the road, like you're more, because with the ACEs, if, if you don't know about this, I encourage everyone listening to this, you should Google it. You should learn about it because guaranteed, you have kids in your room that are affected by drama. Um, but I mean, does this, cause there, there are effects with health and long-term health and like kids that are in, have experienced trauma ha are more likely to have different, different issues come up later as an adult. So then you get into this whole privacy thing, but it sounds like your district's using, you're using it as more holistic. Like yeah. this percentage of my kids have this. Yeah. And the, the survey itself, um, so one, uh, I think that you can distribute it as a school if you wanted to take that approach and then people get the data and it's designed right. to be anonymous. So right. it's one of those to where I don't even think ACEs will allow you to distribute okay. the survey independently with names mm -hmm. attached to it. I think that they're super into it's got to be private because one, right. if it's not private, it is going to hinder responses. Students aren't going right. to want to hit if they know their name is attached to it. Yeah. My dad has a drinking problem. Like they're not going to exactly. feel comfortable with, with marking that. Um, so the best way to do it is to at, like contact ACEs itself. Ask if there's anyone in your area who is trained in distributing the survey and have and see if they can actually come into the school and distribute it themselves. And then at not if not like independent teachers in theory could do it. Obviously, you go right. through your administrators and say, hey, I want to give this to all my students. Here are the privacy portions of it. Right. Nothing is ever going to be done. ACEs will send me just a report of the percentage of my class of mm -hmm. what the overall score is. No name will be attached to it. And so there are definitely methods where teachers can use it in a legal way, um, right. but definitely go through, you know, site administrators first, but it kind of all connects to the trauma also is going to impact how the student receives and learns new information, which is a culturally responsive teaching method. Um, because we know that every culture has a different method of learning and receiving information and not that trauma is a culture. It's just, there are similar aspects to how it impacts learning from that point. And so that's like the biggest thing is like understand how those students are going to receive information and how they're going to respond to discipline in the classroom. We need to understand because like that's the other big portion is that if you see that 80% of your class 
has a nine or higher, they probably will have heartburn with disciplinary practices. So that's one where when you encounter that student, and this should be best practice, um, and it is definitely a culturally responsive practice where it's like, this is my policy. This is how I go through things. This is um, this is what's going to happen after you commit this act three different times. I'm going to do this. Whatever your approach is, if you make that aware to your student and then you're not going to explode on them, right? Because then that's when they will shut down. And this is everyone, but especially students who experience trauma is if you kind of, you know, so to speak, throw down the hammer and lay down the law and it catches them off guard. One thing that I do with my students is I kind of ask them, hey, go out in the hall for a minute. And I'm going to come out there in a couple minutes and we're going to talk. And they're kind of, but and when I go out in the hall, they're kind of like scared. They think that they're going to get in all this trouble. And I basically tell them like, all right, you know my policy. It is X, Y, Z. Once we reach Z, this has to happen. You were doing this in my classroom. How do you think I should respond to it? And you know that's something that's going to take ten minutes out of the class period, and it's going to take up valuable time in the classroom. Um, and some teachers are just unwilling to do that. Uh, because it does take time. And that's going to be the biggest recurring theme of dealing with students with trauma and also culture responsive teaching is that it takes time. But I promise if you take that time, you're going to have, um, you will see a positive impact. And obviously this isn't true for everyone. You will have some students that will have days that you cannot talk to them. You cannot reason with them. And that's a result of something else that's going on. And so that's where you should try to figure out what's going on. Like, why is it that so-and-so is having a real tough time today? I can't even talk to them. Like I told them to put their phone away once and he got up and stormed out of the classroom. Like, okay, there's something going on. And so from that point, what I'll do instead of calling the principal is our call, I'll call our school social worker and say, so-and-so just walked out. I asked him to put away their phone and he stormed out of the classroom and he seemed very upset. I think there's something going on. Um, and that's just responsive where I think too much we feel like it's a disciplinary issue that needs to be handled by the administrator and there needs to be a... Uh, a consequence issued at that level when for me it's like i just want to make sure that kid's okay because that kid is a human and that kid is uh worthy of respect and dignity despite whatever he just said to me in the classroom um and students see that and i have great relationships with my students because they know if i get irritated it's like, man, you got Mr. Logan irritated. You must have really been doing something. And, you know, that's one of those where um, uh, they're not used to that. And they're not used to that because at home, it may have not been that progressive. It may have been, you know, extreme response. And that may be the only way they know how to deal with trouble. Wow, so much to unpack right there. I mean, just uh, I, I've I've heard of these things. I practice some of these things, but like, I mean, you 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 take it to a different level right there. And I mean, I I'm gonna have questions that are gonna come up in the middle of the night, and I I'm just when so when you get a random email at like three forty seven in the morning at some point, right. that that's what it's gonna be. It's because well, I'm gonna wake up with a question about <laughs> everything you just said, but because I mean, just everything you said is so powerful. And so true, and so many educators that just we we've said this thing a lot on the show too. A lot of people they don't know what they don't know, and this right. is one of those things right there. And like you did such an incredible job of explaining it. Well, and 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 Zach, I have to tell you, like this is so timely because I have a student who who fits all these things, and he he, I, I will own I will own my own lack of whatever today because what as we're recording this it may have not been it was like a b c d e f g we got to x and i was like we're done and like in my head i'm like afterwards and i had to go back and talk with this student i said you know i kind of lost my cool and not okay but i mean it was like 
you're right. I mean, there's 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 a lot of things that we as as educators don't realize when we have kids that they have gone through serious stuff even at a young age that that we as adults have never experienced. And I think you're right. It, it's it's that putting in the time up front that pays dividends. So I I appreciate you. This is this is a very. I'm glad you spoke about this because it kind of reminded me of like okay. I know sometimes I got to calm down. <laughs> Yeah, and you did something that was so awesome because you went to the student and you said that you lost your cool, which I think is a major step with these students because they're not used to being apologized to. And this is something to where it, it's even, you know, not to speak negative of any culture, but even certain cultures are when dad says something. Or when dad responds, dad isn't respected to apologize. And so Mm -hmm. when they encounter an adult coming to them and said, hey, you know what? Um, I'm sorry. I lost my cool. They may think like, well, you were the person in authority. You had a right to do that. And so you're tearing down so many barriers with them to where they're just like, oh, you know what? They are approachable. I do feel safe in their classroom, even though I just got in trouble. Like I just got in trouble. He just yelled at me, but then afterwards he said he was sorry. And now I feel more comfortable with him. Okay. And so, and it's like, you can see them process all that. And it's so cool. Well, see, now that's why we waited three years to have you on. But for this exact moment, when I lost my S earlier today, I needed you here to affirm that I needed to fix that. So I appreciate you doing that, man. I will own my own bad behavior. Well, and as we're kind of winding down here, we um, we know that you're on social media. We'd love for you to share that. But you also host a yes. non-education related podcast that Ben and I are 100 percent behind. <laughs> I'm sure a lot of our listeners would be, too. So we'd love to know a little bit more about those. Yeah, so this is another way that I also have opportunity to relate with my students because there's so much Star Wars content that is being released all the time and so i host uh, star wars tv talk and you can find us at star wars tv talk.com and anywhere you get your podcast but i am currently looking for a, a co-host because my other co-host he is running off into the twin suns to take a crazy north american national park RV tour with his family. Um, so he will not be able to do a podcast with me for the foreseeable future. So we are looking for a co-host. If you know anyone, um, they can reach out to me on Twitter at star Wars TV talk. And of course, by emailing me and you can find all that information at our website, star Wars TV talk.com. But we just talk about star Wars television projects. We talk about the movies, of course, but that is something that uh, is one of the few things I do just for fun. So, so I'm going to do this. Jay Colbert, if you are listening to this podcast right now, so Jay is a friend of mine and he's huge Star Wars. He's a, a dean at, at, at one of our schools here. I'm like, dude, you need to reach out to Zach. I'm just going to throw that out right now. I'm, I'm putting him on. I'm putting him on blast. Well, and for yeah, those absolutely. that are not watching live on YouTube or Facebook, Zach's room where he is recording from is literally a cornucopia of Star Wars memorabilia, including movie posters from episodes one, two, and three. The th- the yes. three movies that most Star Wars fans will barely admit they've seen, let alone enjoy. <laughs> so, oh, yeah. which I enjoy the movies. I mean, there's parts of them that were like, I'm sorry, the pod race that was 45 minutes. It could have been 10, but you know what? Yeah. That's neither here nor there. <laughs> well, we could have a whole discussion about Star Wars Resistance versus Clone Wars versus. Mm-hmm. I mean, I I have my I love my Disney Plus. I'll just I'll leave. Mm-hmm. I'll I'll share that. <laughs> mm-hmm. Yeah, absolutely, and that's another thing that transcends through cultures and a cool way to relate with students from all different backgrounds and cultures. Because, I mean, we're dealing with with students who grew up now on the sequel the trilogy, which was crazy because I grew up on. The prequel so i aged myself a bit um and that's kind of one of one of the reasons um that i have a heart for them and of course i was born in modesto california so george lucas hometown yes. that's where i was born so i've kind of my family's been all over the place dad wisconsin to modesto wow. um and yeah so I got to go to the episode three premiere in Modesto, California and meet the one, the only Mark Hamill. 
and uh, he Ooh. signed my book that's back there somewhere. It's hidden back there behind all the stuff. But yeah, I got all that. So it's a fun thing. I love talking Star Wars. And yeah, so come join us over there. Awesome. Well, Zach, thanks so much for joining us. Uh, the three-year yes. wait was totally worth it. So, And yep. I know listeners are probably going to have some questions for you here. So keep this conversation going. Share your thoughts on today's topics by emailing us at info at beeredupodcast.com. Tweet us at beeredupod, hashtag beeredupod. Hit us up on Facebook, our page is beeredupodcast. That's all one word. On Instagram, we're at beeredupod. Our YouTube channel, bit.ly slash beer edu YouTube. We're, we're live streaming our episodes there and on Facebook. So check us out on there. Uh, Zach is also on Twitter at Zach Logan 32 on top of Star Wars TV talk. So follow him and his show. Send us a voice message using the Anchor app. Leave us a review wherever you're listening so more can find it. And Ben, if others want to be on the show like Zach, what, what does one have to do? Yes, you don't need to wait three years. But go in, go to beeredupodcast.com, click on the contact and subscription link and complete the guest form. And we would be remiss without mentioning our great partners. You know, thank you to School Rubric for featuring the Beer EDU podcast. The mission of School Rubric is to help schools, educators and parents and students help tell their stories to all stakeholders so they can make the best choices about enrollment and staffing. So go to schoolrubric.com, find out more about their content um, from educators around the world. And then we're also part of the Codebreaker Podcast Network. You can check out Beer Review Podcast as one of their podcasts that are featured, but also there are some other great podcasts, Staff Room Podcasts, STEM Everyday Life, or STEM Everyday, Teachers on Fire, My Ed Tech Life, so many great podcasts on their um, network. So check them out at codebreakers.com. And Zach, this is the part of the show where Kyle is going to teach us something. So stick around. Kyle, what do you have today? Yeah. So, I mean, continuing on our theme of different kinds of hops that we've done the last couple of episodes. So today we're taking a look at Centennial Hops. This is another really common one. A lot of beers that you know and love feature Centennial Hops. Um, It's very similar to Cascade Hops, which is one of the first ones we talked about. This one was developed in the early 70s. 1974 is when it really became something. But it wasn't commercially available until 1990. So you're still talking like only like 30 years that this hops uh, hop variety has been around. Uh, It was created as a crossbreed of several different hop varieties, a lot like those other ones we've talked about. Uh, It's a good general purpose hop. So aroma, flavoring, and bitterness, where certain hops are good for bittering, some are good for aroma, some are good for flavor. This one is kind of the trifecta. So this is a very nice, versatile hop. Uh, Similar to Cascade in the fact that you get aromas of pine, uh, not as citrusy as a Cascade hop, uh, especially in the grapefruit side of things. It's toned down. You get some floral notes, uh, very clean and bright in its bitterness. And then this one's also used for dry hopping oftentimes, where uh, you get that dry hop that brings out a lot more of those flavors, especially those pine flavors when it's used in that fashion. Uh, It's used in a combination with other hop varieties, uh, sometimes with Cascade and sometimes with Citra that we've talked about. Um, The variety of styles, whereas Cascade and Citra have been mostly pale ale and IPA type beers. Um, This one is also pale ale, IPA, but also American stouts, American wheats, amber ales, and then also barley wine. You'll find Centennial hops in those styles. And when it comes to popular beers that you know that have Centennial Hops, Bell's Two Hearted Ale, one of mm-hmm. my absolute favorites. I know, Ben, you've had that one. Oh, yeah. Founders Centennial IPA. That Both of those beers are awesome, 100% man. Centennial Hops. And then another one that I haven't had in a really long time, Ballast Point out of San Diego makes one yep. called Big Eye IPA. That one has a combination of Centennial and then, Ben, one of your favorite brewers, Dogfish oh, yeah. Head, they yep. make one called Hellhound on My Ale that is features I've, I've not hops. had that. So that that is – Dogfish is an East Coast brewer, and you get some out of here on the West Coast, but definitely it's one – when I'm back on the East Coast that I'm going to look for. Yeah, for sure. So I mean, I've never had a bad beer from Dogfish Head. So no. And uh, it is probably limited on what we can get out here in Nevada coming from yep. a brewery in Delaware, but – uh, I might need to try to find that one because that one is one that is 100 IBU, so kicked Ooh, up in yeah. the hops. So definitely want to check that one out. Hop bomb right there. For sure. 
So that ties things up on episode 104. Yep. Yeah. Hey, Zach, thank you so much for being on the show. I cannot believe we did more than an hour with you. I mean, you have great stuff. I'm super excited that it was well worth the wait to have you on. Well, thank you so much. And anytime you guys want me back, I would be more than happy to join and talk Perfect. about um, some other stuff going on in the education sphere. You guys are doing an awesome job over here, and I'm excited to see where it goes. Great. I, we appreciate that. Thanks a lot. Yep. Thank you, man. And speaking of thanks, listeners, thank you as always. And until next time, may the malts and the hops be with you. Right on.